In the last video, we introduced rules for biconditional introduction and biconditional elimination, and I left you with two problems to try on your own. We're going to go over the solutions now, but as always, if you have the means to financially support the channel, you can hit the join button below to become a member with perks. Uh, if not, you can always like, subscribe, comment, do all the YouTube stuff. I appreciate it all, so thank you for your support, no matter how you give it. Anyways, question one has quite a few hypotheses, and we have to prove that if we have all those hypotheses, we get R, arrow, Q, and not P. So I've set this up because it takes a little bit of time to set this thing up. So I've written our five hypotheses down below. P, if and only if Q, then S and T. Not Q, then S. Not S. Q or S, then not P. And R, then P, if and only if Q. So our goal is to show that if we have R, then we get Q and not P. So what we'll have to do, and let me turn the lines on, is we're going to have to introduce a subproof. And in that subproof, on line six, we're going to assume R. So I'm going to write this down just so I know it's a hypothesis, and the intention is to use a CP on it to introduce the arrow. Now our goal is to get Q and not P. So that's what we should be trying to do. And it's not quite clear at first how we can do this. So I haven't done this proof yet. I wanted to do this and express my thoughts at the same time. So what I see right off the bat is in line 5, if we have R, then we have P, if and only if Q. So I'm going to reiterate that because I want to use it for modus ponens. Uh, whenever I can modus ponen something, I become a very happy boy because it's a very straightforward operation and it usually gets us a step further or at least allows us to work with new information. So in line 8, I have R. If R, then P, if and only if Q. So I'm going to get P, if and only if Q in line 8. So that's from 6 and 7. That's modus ponens. And I realize in the previous line I wrote reiteration from 6, but that should be reiteration from 5. Okay. So now I have P, if and only if Q. And in line 1, I see, if, I see P, if and only if Q, then S and T. So I'm going to write that one down again. I'm going to reiterate it. P if and only if Q. Then we have S and T. So this is line one reiteration. And I can use modus ponens again to get S and T. So that is line eight. That is line nine. And that's modus ponens. Okay. Uh, what is next that's obvious. Well, I can't really use S and not S for a contradiction right now because all I would get is not R out of it. I don't want that. I didn't assume R for a contradiction. Uh, I don't have not Q anywhere, so I can't use not Q arrow S. Uh, what I do have, though, is Q or S arrow not P. And I have S, so I can use or introduction to get Q or S and then get me not P. So I think this is the next strategy. I, I want to try to use 4 at some point. So I'm going to use and elimination on 10 to get me just S. And then in 12, I'm going to use or introduction to give me Q or S. So I can do Q or S because I know S is true. So Q or S will be true regardless of what the value of Q is. So at this point in line 13, I'm going to reiterate uh, line, what is it, line 4. So I have Q arrow S arrow not P. So that's from 4. And let me just reiterate why I want to do this. Uh, because I have not P in the consequent of this proof. I have not P. I have R then not P. So if I can get not P here, that's great because I have one of the two. All I have to worry about after that is getting Q. So in line 14, let me just use green still. Uh, I will get not P from an application of modus ponens on line 12 and 13. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to put a little dot on this line because I got not P. This is good. At this point, I have to get Q. Oh, okay, I have to get Q. I'm not seeing an easy way immediately for getting Q. But what I do notice, and let me just get rid of the mark in line 4, uh, take a look at this. I have Q arrow S. Th this is something I can get. If I have not Q, I get S. And I also know by assumption I have a not S. So because if I put not Q and I get S and I'll hopefully get not S, I'm thinking 
why don't I just assume not Q, find a contradiction, I'll get not not Q out of it, and that will reduce to Q. So I'm going to try that. And this means I'm going to need a little bit more space. So, okay, everything is kept up on here. And just to remember, I'm trying to prove if R, then I get Q and not P. So I have that on the right so you can remember. Okay, I'm going to have to extend these lines more. This is going to be quite a long proof, but that's okay. The longer the proofs are, the, the better the practice is. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to assume not Q in line 15. So this is a hypothesis. This is for a proof by contradiction, reductio ad absurdum. I want to get not not Q out of this, so I can just get Q using double negation. So in line 2, we said if not Q, then S. So this is a reiteration from line 2. I'm going to use modus ponens on those two, line 15 and 16, so that way I can get not S out of it. Sorry, so I can just get S out of it. Not Q, not Q arrow S, I get S. Then, in line 18, I'm going to reiterate line 3. Because I have S in the subproof, but I have not S from before. Not S is an assumption. I now have S and not S, which means that I can get not not Q. Since I've assumed not Q, I get a contradiction, therefore not Q cannot be true. Not not Q has to be true. So from lines 15 to 18, I did RAA. Okay, I have to extend the lines a little bit further. I didn't think this proof was going to take like over 20 lines, but alas, it does. So how far do I need to go? Let's just go there. That might be fine. Uh, so line 20, not not Q. I'm going to do double negation on that to get just Q. So now I have a dot on this line too. So I have not P, I have Q. That's what I want to prove over on the right. If I have R, then I have Q and not P. So in line 21, I'm going to use conjunction introduction to join these together. So from line 14 with not P and line 20 with Q, I used and introduction. Okay. So this then concludes the conditional proof. So from line 6 to line 21, I assumed R. What happens if I have R? And I showed with 14 extra lines that if I have R, I get Q and not P. So from 6 to 21, that was a conditional proof. Okay, so that was a little bit of work. Uh, we can see this whole thing in action if we start with our five assumptions. Uh, what we do is we assume R. This is what we assume. By assuming R, we've shown that we get Q and not P. And in order to do that, we had to do some reiteration and some manipulation to get not P. We had to assume not Q to get not not Q to get Q. And that was able to get us Q and not P. So the entire conditional proof closed and we got R, arrow, Q, and not P. So that was quite a bit of work. You can see how complicated these proofs get, but it was doable. It was doable. Uh, and you saw my thought process the entire time. I just sort of reasoned out uh, what do we have to work with with our assumptions? What haven't we used yet? What are my goals? So what do I want to try to do? Okay, that was question one. Let's do question number two. If we have not P and not Q, then we have P if and only if Q. Okay, on the surface, this seems pretty simple. But I have a feeling that when we try this, it's not going to be that simple. Okay, let's start with our one assumption, which is not P and not Q. Now, I, I need to reason some stuff out on the right first to figure out what the hell I'm even going to do with this, because this just looks like a disaster. Okay, we need to show P if and only of Q, which means we need to assume P and get to Q. We need to assume Q and we need to get to P. Okay, uh, so let's let's set that up. Let's set that up. Uh, I don't know how long these subproofs are going to be, so I'll just do two like this. Okay, so that'll be line two, 
Uh, we're going to assume P here. We're going to try to get Q. And in our second subproof, we're going to assume Q and try to get P. Uh, I don't know what lines we'll end up at, so I'm not going to give a line for Q yet. So this will be a hypothesis. This is for uh, biconditional introduction. And so is this Q. OK. I have not P and I have not Q. So right away, I think it's going to be really easy to get a contradiction. Which means that my goal here is to get Q. That's my goal. I think what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to start a new subproof inside the subproof, line 3, and I'm going to have to assume not Q. Because I think if I assume not Q, I'm going to be able to get a contradiction. In, in fact, I kind of see it right away. So this is another hypothesis. I'm going to assume this for a contradiction. That's what I want. Okay. Well, I'm going to reiterate not P and not Q from line one. And I'm going to use on line five, I'm going to use and elimination on line four. Okay, so I have not P and not Q, therefore I have not P. From line two, we had P, because we assumed P for biconditional introduction, so that's just reiterated from two. At this point, I see not P, I see P, therefore this initial assumption that not Q is correct has to be false, which means that we're going to get not not Q in line seven. So from line three to six, we did a proof for contradiction. We found a contradiction, therefore our assumption wasn't correct. We got not not Q, and therefore in line eight, we just used double negation on not not Q to give us Q. Okay, that actually worked out wonderfully. So we got half of it done. And because we have not P and not Q, it's gonna be pretty much the exact same proof. So line nine is our assumption for Q. Uh, which means that if we want to get, well, in the end, how many lines does it take? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I have a feeling that we're going to get P on this line. Just call it, call it a hunch, call it whatever you want. But it looks like it's going to be the same proof. So, okay. Let's just do the same thing then. Uh, instead of assuming not Q this time, I'm going to assume not P, and I'm going to try to get not not P out of it. Okay, so line 10, this is another hypothesis. Once again, for RAA, uh, in line 11, I'm going to reiterate not P and not Q. So that's from line 1 I'm reiterating. I'm going to get not Q in line 12, using and elimination on line 11. In line 13, I'm going to reiterate Q from line nine, because we have Q here, so we can reiterate it. We have not Q from before. So because we have Q and not Q, we know that this assumption not P is not correct, which means it must be not not P. So yeah, this is just line 10 to 13, RAA, and then in line 15, not not P becomes P. So from line 14, we've done double negation. At this point, we've shown that if we have P, then we have Q. And if we have Q, then we have P. So at this point, what we can do is in line 16, we can do biconditional introduction. So from line uh, 2 to 8, we proved P arrow Q. From line 9 to 15, we proved Q arrow P. Therefore, we can do biconditional introduction on these, and that is the end of our proof. We've shown that if we have not P and not Q, that proves P if and only if Q. Okay, that's a little bit of an interesting proof idea there. So it's been a while since I've done one like this where pretty much you only work with uh, embedded subproofs to prove the entire thing. Not quite as complicated as the first in terms of how many lines there are, but in the concept behind it, uh, it is quite difficult. So how I did this here, I didn't just do this proof from line one all the way to the end. I didn't just use that train of thought. I, I thought about my subproofs. What do I need to prove? I need to prove if P then Q and if Q then P. So I sort of built two things 
piece by piece. And I sort of went backwards at some points. So I said, okay, I need Q. So how do I get Q? Well, I have P and I know I have not P. So what I should do is I should assume something for a contradiction. And I got it to work in one case. And I realized, wait, I'm basically doing the same thing for the second subproof. So I just copied the second thing as I did the first, but with different values and it happened to work out. So anyways, that's it for these examples. I think the sixth video turned out longer than the actual video on the rules for these things. But, you know, when the proofs are complicated, it takes some time. So if you have any questions, as always, leave them in the comments below and I'll get back to you when I can.